you, Lord. I bless 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 you, Lord. Oh, you are so good. Lord, you are so good. I bless you, Lord. I bless you,
says the Lord. Know that the shift is taking place. Now is the time and the season to lock and load, says the Lord. Now is the season to pursue and recover all, says God. It's a season now for recovery, says God. Things are going to begin to come and happen rapidly, says the Lord. Acceleration time is here and now. Know that we shall begin in this hour and season with one victory after another, says the Lord. The Lord says pursue and recover all. This is the time to be bold and to be courageous. Step forward. Claim your inheritance, says the Lord, for your time and your moment is here. Know that the enemy has been caught, and in the midst of the chaos, I'm going to make a way forward, says the Lord. In the midst of the chaos and the anarchy, know that I shall make a way forward. Don't look at the background, don't look at the backdrop, says the Lord, for I shall make a way where there seems to be no way, says the Lord. I will step right in, step right in, step right in to the rhythm of your heart. I will step right in. Step right in, step right in to the rhythm of your heart. I'm step right in, step right in, step right in to the rhythm of your heart. I'm step right in, step right in, step right in to the rhythm of your heart. Cause Lord, you are so holy. Cause Lord, you are so holy.
for you need to just not step in, but you also need to walk in, says the Lord God Almighty, to get this acceleration that I have just told you, says the Lord God Almighty. It's gonna take action on your part to receive what I have for you this season. So just don't sit by, but walk in, says the Lord God Almighty, and don't back up. I will walk right in, walk right in, walk right in to your revelation. Walk right in, walk right in, walk right in to your revelation. I walk right in, walk right in, I walk right in to your revelation. I walk right in, walk right in, walk right in to your revelation. I walk right in, walk right in. Walk right in to your revelation. Walk 
All of creation is longing, rolling for the sons of the Lord to arise. All of creation is longing, groaning for the sons of the Lord to arise. All of creation is longing, groaning for the sons of the Lord to revise. All of creation is longing, groaning for the sons of the Lord to arise. I will take my place.
Cause worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. There is only one found worthy. There is only one found worthy. There is only one found worthy. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus And how we love that name How we love that name How we There is only one found worthy 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 mm. There is only one found worthy To worship, there is no one like you. 
for this right here <laughs> There's no one like you I was created All for this right here Oh, just to worship Just to worship Just to worship oh. dimension says the Lord and in this place there will be a revelation of my immeasurable grace there will be a limitless love that you will walk into and the Lord says that this will be a season where you will go into the depths of my heart and you will feel the love like you have never felt it before there's a fresh baptism of love that's coming upon the body in this season says the Lord for there is a hurt and a dying world within the church. And the Lord says, as you begin to pour out my love 
It will be like the fragrance of a spring rain that brings them to life once again. And the Lord says, when my people who are called by my name arise, they will bring the rain to others and my love will be poured out and the sweet aroma of my grace will bring transformation to this place. So let my love begin to flow, says the Lord, like you have never allowed it before. As I draw you into that deeper dimension of who I am in this season. That place of immeasurable grace and limitless love. Let it permeate the atmosphere of your own heart, says the Lord. So that you will be a walking and talking example of me in the earth. And you will... You will, says the Lord. You will, says the Lord. Be all that I have called you to be. And the Lord says, when you realize how much you mean to me, it will shatter your reality. Will shatter your reality.
Glory to God. Glory to God. Father God, we thank you for your glory in this place. Father God, we thank you for your presence, for this wonderful place of worship, Father God, which you have allowed us to enter into. We thank you, Father God, for your divine presence. Let's just stay in that place of worship right now. Let's just stay in that place of worship right now. Father God, we just continue to give you praise in this place. We continue to give you worship in this place. We continue to thank you in this place. Because, Father God, you alone are worthy. You alone are great. You alone are mighty. We praise you. We worship you. Come on, Lord. Thank you for being in this place, Father God, in a deep way. Thank you for continuing to minister to our hearts, Lord. Thank you for bringing the healing rain, Father God, that falls from heaven. Thank you for giving us the honor to bring before you, Father God, fragrant fragrant incense. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you. It's amazing how the Lord confirms everything. And it's amazing how the Lord continues to speak prophetically. And there was a shift in the spirit when we all started to walk up to the front together and I felt the Lord shifting everything shifting us into a place of overdrive, into a new place in Him. And I feel like the Lord was just shifting us into a new place, in a new season, because of the surrender in our hearts to worship Him with reckless abandon. And I was, as I was praying earlier about the tithe, the Lord put Revelation 5, 8 on my heart. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature was, is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such are as in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard the saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And it's amazing when the Lord speaks prophetically through the worship because everything, everything that is written in this verse is exactly what we just worshiped. So Lord, we just thank you for the honor of bringing before your throne golden bowls of fragrant incense. So today, in a new way, when we bring up our tithes and offering, let's stay in a place of worship, a place where we recognize that our tithes and our offering, we're still in that place of worship, that the place of worship is a place of love and a place of reverence for our Lord, that we're not giving to receive, but we're giving to give to our King. Just as we worship Lord, the Lord with reckless abandon, let us worship Him still with our tithes and offering with reckless abandon, not looking for what we can receive, but to honor our Father, giving Him what He has given to us. Bring up your offerings.
stretch your hands. <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you for the honor to give into your kingdom. We thank you for the honor to worship you. Father God, to come to a place in freedom and liberty and bring praises to your name, we thank you for the honor of bringing the first fruits, Father God, of the finances that you've blessed us with. We just thank you for the honor to give back, Father God, for all you've given to us. We glorify you right now in Jesus' name. Good evening, good evening. How's everyone doing this evening? Well, can we give a big round of applause to the worship team and then just to Jesus right now? His presence was so sweet in this building during worship. You gotta love when, when he shows up. I just have a few announcements. Um, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., uh, right here, so that's tomorrow morning, and then we'll be back with Glenn tomorrow night at six, okay? So six tomorrow, not 7, 6 p.m. Everybody say 6 p.m. All right, awesome. Okay, so 6 p.m. tomorrow with Glenn again. And then we've got um, Monday at 6.30. If uh, you would like to learn about um, essential oils, uh, we've got Mama Hug and Kelty and uh, Brandy, who's going to be here, and they'll be talking and doing a class uh, once a month on oils and different things. So if you're interested in a more natural way of taking care of your body and your home, um, that's the, the place you want to be. So that's 6.30 Monday right here. We uh, continue with our Wow Wednesdays. Uh, if you don't know what Wow Wednesdays are here at the Dwelling Place, it's the time that we equip and empower the saints. We believe in equipping and empowering every individual to fulfill the purpose and destiny that God has on their individual life. So Wednesday night, that's what we do. We get to share our testimonies. We get to hear from those that are in the congregation. And it really is a powerful time, and it's really awesome. Um, Thursday. Now, everybody pay attention because it's the schedule change. Everybody say schedule change. Schedule change. Okay, so Thursday, we are not going to do the deliverance mentoring Thursday, okay, due to some uh, traveling issues. So what we're going to do is we are going to do it this week, but we're going to do it on Saturday morning, okay? Saturday morning, 10 a.m., we'll have some coffee and some donuts for you guys, and then we're going to go in straight into the deliverance teaching, okay? So everybody say Saturday at 10 a.m., all right, I'm hoping everybody on live stream is doing the same thing. Make sure, make sure you write that down. The last thing that I want to announce is we are doing um, a family movie night. You know, sometimes it's really hard to get your family together. It's hard to find entertainment for all ages that everybody will enjoy. So on the 29th, which is a Friday evening at 6.30, we're going to come in here. We're going to turn this into like a movie theater. We're going to serve pizza and popcorn and drinks. Um, and we're going to uh, play a movie, uh, The Prince of Egypt. Uh, it's a good one, you know, back, yeah. Glenn likes it. It's one of his favorites. He watches it every weekend. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, it really is an awesome movie. And so we're looking forward to it. If you would like to come, uh, sign up in the back. If you know people who would like to come, they can sign up on Facebook. Um, and the only reason we're asking you to sign up is because everybody know we got to order pizza. Like I'm not going to be in the back like making dough and stuff. That's not me. Um, but there are plenty of places in town that make pizza. So I'm going to order it. So I want to make sure you have enough pizza. So if you plan on coming and you want to come, if you'll sign up in the back or sign up online, we'll greatly appreciate it. And um, that's all the announcements that I have. So am I handing this straight to Glenn or Dr. Russ? All right, here we go, Dr. Russ. Hallelujah. <laughs> You know, Glenn had an opportunity to come and visit with us during uh, winter camp this year. How many of you enjoyed that time we had together? Just a, just a wonderful moment. And tonight, uh, not long, right before the service started, uh, Joan called Pastor Maeve, and, uh, you know, Pastor Maeve was just out there. The reason why, Jen, uh, why Glenn was able to join us was uh, Joan's husband, Frank, wasn't well, and he's going on to be with the Lord. And, and uh, Pastor Maeve did the services in that. And he, she just wanted to send her greeting. And we're looking forward to having her to come out soon. But keep her and her family in your prayers. She's just a, a wonderful woman of God. And uh, Pastor Maeve and I, she's the one that introduced us. She's a spiritual mama. Uh, she worked for eight years with Catherine Kuhlman and over 20 years with Pastor Benny Hinn. We hope to have her down here again real soon. And just a powerful woman of God, but you know it's that 
season and for her, so just keep her family in, in prayer there. But it was a good opportunity for you to, to meet Glenn Garland, who is, uh, many of you know, is just a wonderful teacher and a very strong prophetic voice, a missionary to the nations. And he was uh, raised on the Calvary campground under the Heflin family anointing and ministry. He was mentored by Brother Wallace Heflin and Sister Ruth and uh, was there on the campground all that time. And now he's under Pastor Jane Lauder, who has been there for 20 years now and just a powerful woman of God. And Amen. It's a great place to be at. And it's a strong heritage and great roots that he has in the prophetic and apostolic ministry that's been going on there at Calvary for more than 60 years. It's that strong Pentecostal prophetic anointing, one of the strongest prophetic companies around the world. So it's a great place to be. And that mantle sits on, on Brother Glenn and, uh, and his wife. Debbie, who's just an awesome woman of God, we'll have to have her down here pretty soon too. She is the head administrator there at the campground and a powerful voice to the nations as well. Glenn, uh, last night, he told us a little bit of his story and that his call as a missionary. And uh, he's been a missionary all these years from his teenage years. He's been to more than 55 nations. Isn't that incredible? What a wonderful thing to, to happen to be in these nations. And some of them were there many times, like the Philippines and Israel, and just a, a great call as a missionary to the nations with a, with a heart form. So tonight, open up your heart and receive. You know, when you have a prophetic missionary in the house, God's going to begin to give you things for the nations and, and give you a heart for the nations and different people groups to, to pray for because that's the mantle and the anointing you know, that's on his life. So we really want to open up to what that's all about. We had a great time here last night with a wonderful prophetic flow. And, and that's the root gifting of that ministry is that it is profoundly prophetic. And uh, every winter, they have winter camp. I was just up there doing winter camp and we go back every summer uh, for a summer camp time, but they come in from all the nations of the world, from India and Africa. And Sister Ruth, when, uh, uh, when she was alive, she went to every single nation in the world, every nation. Right? There was the ones in, that were closed and open and everything. She visited every single nation in the world. Uh, her, the main headquarters is there in Ashland, Virginia, about 90 miles south of Washington, D.C., but they also had for more than 30 years on Mount Zion, they had a ministry there in Jerusalem, in Israel. So they had a school there and a center there that Sister Ruth uh, oversaw. So just a, a wonderful heritage and a deep heritage that's almost life. And he's also a great teacher. So tonight, let's put our hands and our hearts together. He's gonna to be here again tomorrow night. We're gonna have a great time. If you're, if you're available and you don't have a home church, tomorrow morning we'll be here ministering tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. I'm sharing some things about uh, the kingdom principles and the parables and the vision from God for the kingdom. So come on out and be with us there too here at the dwelling place. We'll be back here again tomorrow night at six o'clock. Six o'clock tomorrow night, so make sure you, you know it's a little bit early. Now let's put our hands and hearts together and welcome a missionary to the nations of the world in a very prophetic voice, Glenn Garland. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Hallelujah. Lots of great things. In John chapter 7. Amen. We started last night and we just talked about three baptisms. They're not the only three baptisms, but they're three very important baptisms. And they're three important baptisms that we see all the way through Scripture from Genesis to Revelations. And we're not going to get into all of that because our topic last night was the same theme as tonight, and that is out of Acts chapter 19, where 23 years after the day of Pentecost, Paul is in Ephesus, and he said to the disciples of John, he said to them, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were saved? And they said, we had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And that is the thought that we have for these three sessions, and that is, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, all of us here 
are probably really good Christians. And I'm pretty certain there's at least four or five people here in the auditorium who understand theology better than I do. But without any of our theology or any of our Christianity, we must address and approach the question of, of Paul, have we received the Holy Spirit? And it's not about what happened um, in 1904 at Azusa Street Mission in California. It's not about the birthing of an Assemblies of God denomination or a movement of God. It's a principle that transcends that. It goes back in history about receiving God. It has always been the heart of God that he would be received by his people. Sin separated man from God. And in that separation from God, man no longer knew God. And it was always God's desire. And throughout scripture, his plan to reveal himself to man. That's his plan. That's his purpose. Now we're living in this day. And this message that Paul gives is an extremely important message about receiving the Holy Spirit. Because it's not just about what we have in our baptisms, what we have in regard to speaking in tongues, what we have in regard to receiving from you know, the Lord in our salvation. It's about hosting the presence of God and receiving the Holy Spirit on a regular basis, receiving the Holy Spirit every day of our life, receiving the Holy Spirit and everything that we do, allowing him to partner with us, fellowship us and allowing us to be intimate with him. This is an extremely important message. If you look at the beginning of John chapter 7, you see that, that um, it, it kind of opens up. I love this about family. Family is such an important part of all of our identities. And, and Jesus' family didn't believe in him. And, and he had two brothers. These two brothers would um, eventually believe in him. They would be in the upper room. They would receive the Holy Spirit in the upper room. And they would have a, a, a clear picture of Jesus and what it is that Jesus provided for them, not only as payment for their sin, but pattern for their life. And, and thank God in 397 at the Second Council of Carthage, when they gathered together all the sacred writings and that, that were being rehearsed in the churches um, throughout those 200 years after the death, of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, they gathered those scriptures, those um, parchments together and they prayed over them and they canonized 27 books of the New Testament. And out of those 27 books of the New Testament, we find that two of those books were written by the very brothers of Jesus who did not believe in him. So that's just a, a testimony to us about the times in our life when we don't believe in Jesus, where we think we believe in Jesus and we say we believe in Jesus, but we don't believe in Jesus. There's hope because we can still write a book. Hallelujah. We can still be a part of what God's doing. And, and so Jude and James were, were those two brothers. So when you read the book of James and you read the book of Jude, you know, you get this, these two brothers who didn't believe in Jesus. If, if you look in, in John chapter 7 and verse 5 and it says, even his brothers did not believe in him. And, and that's talking about, about James and, and Jude. And, and if you read down a little bit further, I love this, that there's this discussion. And, and, and the brothers had gone ahead into Jerusalem. It's a time of feasting. And they went on in into Jerusalem. And, and, and Jesus remained in Galilee, Galilee. But then he went a little bit later. And he called up with them a little bit later. And, and there was discussion going around. Some people were saying, man, this Jesus is a great guy. And others were saying, no, this guy is not so good. And, and there was a, you know, a lot of opinions opinions about who this Jesus is. And, and, and I think that this portion of scripture right here where we're at in John chapter 7 is a, a great explanation of why it is we do not need bracelets to say what would Jesus do. Because he's already did what he's done. So we don't have to ask what he would do. He's already done it. So all we have to do now is we just need to say what did Jesus do instead of what would Jesus do. And, and so here in this portion of scripture, it's, it's something really great. Verse 16, here we are. In verse 16, it says that Jesus answered these people that were marveling and they were saying, you know, who, who is this man? You know, where does he study at? Where does he get his theology? And look at what Jesus says. My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's good to have a doctrine that comes from God. 
And, and he says, my doctrine is not mine, but it comes from him who sent me. And if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. So it, you can have man's doctrine, and man's doctrine might have some good points in it, but it's always going to be limiting, and it's always going to be inefficient. But you can have God's doctrine, but the only way that you can have God's doctrine is if you're willing to do the will of God. Only those who are willing to do the will of God can have the doctrine of God. And, and herein is a key. Herein is a, a huge key because one day Jesus was with his disciples and, and, and they were together and his brothers and his mother came to see him and, 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 and they came to, to visit Jesus and, and, and they announced that, hey, your mom is here. The Holy Mary is here. No, that's just a joke. And, and um, you know, and, and they, he said, who, who, who is my mother? Who is my brother? But them who do the will of my father. Doing the will of the father was pivotal in the life of Jesus. It was so important to the life of Jesus that he didn't do anything unless it was the will of the father. Imagine that in 2019 to change our mission statement that we're not going to do anything unless it's the will of the father. Amen. You know, every once in a while, we'll ask God if what we're doing is his will, but to do everything in God's will. And, and Jesus said, my theology doesn't come from man. My doctrine doesn't come from man. I have a heavenly theology. It comes from the Father. And the only one who can have that theology is the one who does the will of the Father. And, and so he's saying these things, and, and it's just kind of really bringing a, a disruption to the organized structure of the day. And I'm going to tell you that once you start believing something, it becomes an organized structure. And, 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 and before too long, it might have started off as God. But if, if we spend too much time on what it is that we think is so important rather than what God's will is, then that very thing that at one time was a blessing to us will be a hindrance to us. Because God is all the time moving us into a deeper place, a further place, a more productive place, a place where we can be more effective, a place where we can know him more intimately. And sometimes the steps that we have in the beginning, they change as they go along. Let me give you just an example. Like for instance, Paul the Apostle. A lot of what we believe today in regard to eschatology comes you know, from the writings of Paul, especially the writings that are in the book of Thessalonians. And so in the book of Thessalonians, he makes this really profound statement, which today is even a really big debatable statement when it comes to eschatology. And that is that we who are alive and remain shall be called up with him, hyparzo, and so shall we ever be with him in the clouds. So what does Paul say? He says, we who are alive and remain. Because he believed that in his lifetime, he was going to see the coming of the Lord. He believed that he was going to be a part of that gathering of the saints. Where he talks about the assembling of the saints being one event. He says the assembly of the saints and the, the coming of the Lord. Those two different events, the assembling of the saints and the coming of the Lord, he believed that he was going to be a part of the assembling of the saints. And so, you know, he said, we who are alive and remain. But then when we get to 2 Timothy, and now he's in prison again, but this time he's not in a house prison. He's in a dungeon. This time he's in a prison where, you know, he's chained up and he's not being treated properly and he's not allowed to have guests. I, I like to um, use the, the Hollywood version. Um, how many saw Paul the Apostle? It just came out not too long ago, and the guy who played Jesus in The Passion, Jim Caviezel, he played Luke in this one. And you see that Paul is down in a, in a dungeon. Well, that's what you see in 2 Timothy when he's writing 2 Timothy. At the end of the book of Acts, you see him in a house prison. But that's not the time period. Many theologians believe that he would take a fourth 
missionary journey. And after the fourth missionary journey, on his return to Rome, that he would be put in a prison by Nero, and that's where he would be beheaded. And that's what we have in regard to the Fox's Book of Martyr in church history. But what did he say in 2 Timothy? He said this. He said, I have fought the fight. I have run the race. Now I'm going for my rewards. He knew now that he wasn't a part of the we who are alive and remain. Why? Because his progression was a little bit different. Now, there's certain things that never change. But there are some things that we need to see. Like, for instance, what we're talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. Because already, whenever you read that scripture, you're going to find out that most people in the Pentecostal movement or the Assemblies of God movement or the Church of God movement or the Charismatic movement have already identified receiving the Holy Spirit with just the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But that's not what Paul is talking about. He's not talking about just a one-time event that gives you giftings. He's talking about every day are you receiving the Holy Spirit. Every day are you welcoming the Holy Spirit. Every day are you opening up your life and you're saying, Holy Spirit, come and fill me. I love that portion of scripture that Paul writes in, in the book of Ephesians where he says this. He says, do not be drunk with wine in access, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Have you ever exegeted that scripture? Because it has a really great flavor to it. Here's what it says. It says, do not be drunk with wine to excess, but be being filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that when you're reading and you're seeing that, that on the day of Pentecost, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you're reading just a few chapters later and he's at Cornelius' house and then they are all filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and you're seeing that he's getting filled again. That you're not just going to get filled one time. That you're going to be filled every time that you receive the Holy Spirit. Let me just say that again. You're not just getting filled one time. You're going to get filled every time you receive the Holy Spirit. So we have to be in a position where we are always receiving the Holy Spirit. We, we opened up yesterday talking about Matthew chapter 12. And in Matthew chapter 12, he, he, Jesus says that when a spirit comes out of you, it, it's, it's almost like a picture of salvation. When you're delivered and, and you're brought into salvation, you, you're emptied. Those things that used to occupy you, those things that used to bind you, you were a slave to sin, but you're no longer a slave to sin. You've been liberated and now you're free and now you're empty and now you're swept and now you're clean. And now that you're empty, you don't want to stay. Stay empty. Something occupied you before and you need something to occupy you again. And that something is someone and his name is Holy Spirit. And if you are empty and you are not occupied with the Holy Spirit, if you are not receiving the Holy Spirit, then those spirits that came out of you, when they can't find the resting place, they're going to get seven more demons. And then you wonder why Saturday morning you're going to be here for delivering teaching because you did not learn how to receive and be filled with the Holy Spirit spirit. Whew. Preaching hard now. Why am I preaching so hard? Tap me up just a little bit on my mic. Hallelujah. And if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. And he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. Now, that right there, I just want to talk about this because as a missionary, I have a, a, a wonderful opportunity to go into a lot of places where there are a lot of things that have already been established. And in order to, to, to build what Christ is wanting to build, be built, then you step into that anointing that we read in Jeremiah chapter 1. And that is, I give you the keys to the nations. That's the missionary's heart. Jesus was, you know, the original missionary. He went to a special people group. They were called Adam's kind. And he went to Adam's kind to make them the second Adam's kind. And so when you go in, you're taking those keys. And what did he say to Jeremiah? He said, you will root out and you will throw down. 
And, and that's, you know, a, a, a big principle of daily living. Daily living has got to have that principle in that, in that area. God, I thank you for everything that you've done in my life, the things that, that I know and the things that I think I know. And what I want is the things that really need to be known. And so help me with the things that I know and the things, things that I think to know to, to pull down the things that are keeping me from the things that I really need to know. You got that? The things that I know. Say that. The things that I know. Say that the things that I think I know and the things that I really need to know. And the things you really need to know are many times not being embraced because of the things you know and the things you think you know. I, I like what Ronald Reagan said about his opposition party. He says it's not that our Democrats are dumb. It's just that they know so many things that just aren't true. And, 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 and that's kind of how it is. Now, that wasn't a political statement. That's just to let you know there's a principle in that. It's not that, that we're wrong. It's just that we, we just know so many things that aren't true. And, and what happens is that a lot of times when we take man's words, and that's why, you know, my particular style of speaking is expositional because I don't want to bring man's words. Even though I've studied man's words and, and my degree is in man's words, my focus is God's words. And, 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 and the premise of the ministry, the ministry is don't just believe what I say, be a Berean and let what I say get you in the word of God to find out if it's really true. And I'm not talking about going to the bookshelf and buying the bestseller. I'm talking about pulling out the old concordance, you know, uh -huh. and, and, and you can have, there's three different kinds. I mean, if you want crude interpretation, you can get the crudence. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you want fruity interpretation, you can get the vines. If you want strong interpretation, you can get the, concord, uh, the, the strongs. No, that, was, that was funny. But at the end of the day, you know, it's about knowing what God said. And Jesus made it very important that, that he wasn't taught by man. He wasn't taught by man. He was taught by God. And the church isn't built on a revelation that man gets. So if you think that you can build this church on the revelation that, that can, is coming from, from Pastor Rush, you're wrong. Pastor Russ's job is connected to the one who really gives you revelation, and that's Jesus, that's the Father who gives you a revelation of Jesus Christ. So the church is built upon a revelation of Jesus Christ that comes not from man, but comes from God. And when you get this revelation, it changes your life, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the power of a transformed life. But what happens is, is when you don't have a revelation that comes from heaven and you have only a revelation that comes from man, then you give yourself opportunity to be taken over by the enemy over and over and over and over again. And you're always doubting, you're always doubting, you think you're doubting the word, but really you're doubting man's doctrine. Because if you had a revelation of Jesus that came from the Father, then you would, be, have, a, you would have a transformed life and that transformed life would begin to set you free from everything that hell would try to bring against you. Gives you keys so that you can throw down. And then after you throw down, after you destroy, then you can build and plant. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to build and plant on something we've never thrown down and destroyed. And, and what happens if, if you go and you, and, and you lay your cement over a weed bed? That cement's going to be nice for a little while. You're going to walk on that cement for a little while. But you're going to find, just like the, 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 the sidewalks all over, you know, Pensacola, that after a while, those weeds are going to start coming back through. And those weeds are going to begin to break up that cement. And then that very foundation that you have is going to be destroyed. Why? Because you didn't get rid of those things to excavate the land so that you can build and you can plant. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus came, he said, I didn't come with man's ideals. I didn't come with man theology. I didn't come with your interpretations. He said, and, 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 um, and I think it's like the 24th chapter of Matthew, he said something to these, listen to what they say, but don't do what they do because they put on you burdens that they themselves are not willing to bear. And he said, the scribes and the Pharisees are hypocrites because they draw nigh to God with their mouth and they honor God with their lips, but their hearts not with God. So he was bringing something totally different. He, he said in, in the very first recorded message, he said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, you have heard it said that if you kill somebody, you're a murderer. But I say, if you have wrath in your heart, it's sin. And, and, then, and then he said, you have heard it said that if you're caught in an adulterous affair, that, that, that it's sin. But I say to you, if you look on a woman and you lust them, then it's sin. And so he was dealing with something deeper than the outside. 
He was dealing with something deeper than the cement. He was dealing with the weeds underneath of it. He was rooting out. He was throwing down. And so Jesus is, is talking. You might say, well, Glenn, why are you talking about this? We're talking about receiving the Holy Spirit because you need to get this. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. So, you know, all these people, think about it. Think about it today. And, and let me just be um, like, 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 like Paul for a moment and have a little folly. Okay. We have all different names to kind of identify ourselves. Like, for instance, we have Calvinist, Lutherans, Armenianist. You understand that? There you go. Who's getting the glory? Is God getting the glory? No. We're Christians. And if we're Christ ends, then we need to focus on what Christ said, and that is to do the will of the Father so that we can get the instruction and the wisdom and the theology of the Father, which is found in Scripture, and take that and apply it to our life so that we will represent not ourselves, but give glory to the one who sent us, and then there'll be no unrighteousness in us. Powerful statement. And so if you fast forward and you come down to verse 37... Here in this same chapter, Jesus is speaking and he says, On that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. So now Jesus is preparing the way. There was the forerunner to Jesus. The forerunner to Jesus was prepare the way, make the way straight. Behold the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. But now Jesus, now he is becoming a forerunner. And he's preparing the way. And he's saying, if any be in thirst. And, and notice the context here. Because he says, it doesn't say that he just said this. He said he yelled it. He was passionate about this. Here he is at this feast. And, and at first, before, while the, the brothers are going to the feast, we find out the brothers don't believe in him. And they're mocking him and saying, come on, if you're really this guy that you say you are, you need to come on. And Jesus said, no, it's not yet my time. But he sneaks up on him and he listens to what he has to say. And then he says, all right, now there's going to be some doctrine that comes from heaven, not from the earth. And he begins to say, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And like the scripture says, here Jesus is endorsing scripture. Do you see that? Jesus said, in verse 38, it's in red, he who believes in me as the scripture said. And this is something that we need to really realize is that there is an antichrist spirit already on the earth. And the Antichrist spirit is trying to move you away from Scripture. And we have preachers today who can preach whole messages without even looking at a Scripture. And they will pack auditoriums. And they will talk about everything. You know, I like the good old-fashioned. Right, I understand if you have to use your electronic device, that's cool. But I like the old-fashioned style of preaching where you tell people to open your Bibles. Because you know what? It might be the only time in the week that they open their Bibles. And there's just something about putting your eyes on the paper or your eyes on the screen. Because when you put your eyes on the Word, then that which is, you know, information becomes inspiration. And then there's revelation. And when the revelation comes, then there's transformation. And when there's transformation, there's greater consecration. And when there's greater consecration, there's a given sanctification. And when there is a given sanctification, you can bet you're going to see the justification through a glorification. And that's what God wants us to understand is that Jesus himself, what Jesus says matters most. And he said, as it said in Scripture, as it said in Scripture. And then... He says, 
Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 is extremely important. Because here is an end note. This is an end note. And here's what the end note says. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. See, now Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you something that comes from heaven. This isn't man's theology. This is heavenly theology. And then he says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the end note says, he spoke this concerning the Spirit. But then you have to read in this too. And he says, whom those believing in him would receive. What's that word right there that's so important to this talk? Those who believe in him would receive. I want a river of living water flowing out of me. Do you believe in Jesus? Are you receiving him? Are you receiving the Holy Spirit? Pastor, I, I want to see miracle signs and wonders operating in and through my life. Are you receiving the Holy Spirit? Because, you know, getting the degree from Southeastern isn't going to do it. It's receiving the Holy Spirit. You can have all of your degrees. You can have your MMA. You can have, oh, that's mixed martial arts. I don't know. You can have, maybe that's what you need. Maybe we need to throw away our PhDs and get MMAs. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord have mercy. You guys are so fun. Thank you for letting me be me. I have preached messages where I stand like this the whole time and talk just like this, and it was very hard. <laughs> but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is really important. We're going to come back to this last portion in just a moment that the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But now let's fast forward because Jesus already opened up this can of worms about the Holy Spirit. Already John the Baptist, we saw it last night. We saw it in Matthew chapter three. We saw it in Luke chapter three. We saw it in John chapter one. We saw it in, um, in um, Matthew, Mark chapter one. And we also saw it in Acts chapter one where Jesus spoke about it. But Jesus said, you have heard it said from John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was already teaching about the one who would come whose shoes he wasn't worthy to latch, but he would baptize in the Holy Ghost and with fire, that he would be the one that would open the door. He would be the one that was the key to unlock the door that we might be that habitation of the Holy Spirit that we might look at the life of Jesus and not only see him as our savior but we would also see him as our example because now as Christians we would live the life that Jesus lived like the scripture that everybody loves to preach, you know, you, you go to all the healing evangelists and they love to preach this and, 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 and it says that Jesus is speaking and he says that if you believe in me, the things that I do, you shall do likewise and greater things shall you do because I send to my father which is in heaven. So all the healing evangelists are saying we're going to do greater things than Jesus did. I don't know that I subscribe to that thought simply because I like to interpret scripture from the basis of the original transcripts. And the word there isn't talking about doing something greater than raising the dead. What's greater than raising the dead? I mean, it's not talking about something greater than, you know, <laughs> healing leprosy. I mean, what, what is greater than healing leprosy? As, as a matter of fact, the way that Luke would write it in Acts chapter 10, he would say that Jesus went about empowered by the Holy Spirit and he healed all manner of disease. And, and, and what's greater than healing all manner of disease? If he healed all manner of disease, what manner of disease is there to heal if he healed all manner of disease? I don't know. I don't know. But what that's saying is something entirely different, just like Jesus just said about the heavenly revelation. And he said, out of you shall flow rivers. And then this isn't something that's going to happen now. It had not yet come because Jesus was not yet glorified, but it was going to come because those who believed in Jesus, they would receive the Holy Spirit. And last night, what did we learn? 
we learned the first baptism we talked about last night was the baptism that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I believe it's around about verse 3 or 5. And it says simply this, that the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body, into one body. One spirit baptizes us into the body. Now, we are collectively the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no debate to this fact and this thought and this theory. And that is Jesus was one man walking on the earth in his bodily ministry. And he could only do miracles where his body went. He did miracles where his body went. And his body was limited to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Now, the Holy Spirit is baptizing us into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus is still limited to doing miracles wherever his body goes. The only difference is now he only had one body and there's more than 600 million spirit-filled believers on the planet today. So now we're doing more, greater things are we doing now because Jesus has ascended into the Father which is in heaven. Because now we're a part of that body. Does that make sense? You got that? Don't just take my word for it. Go home, get your strongest concordance, look up the words, find it yourself. Hallelujah. So now Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit. He's speaking about the Holy Spirit getting ready to come. Shoot over with me in, in, in the book of John. We're going to stay in John for a little while. And, and, and look, look with me in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Here it is, Jesus is speaking again. Remember, what Jesus says is what matters most. Turn to the person next to you and say, what Jesus says is what matters most. Jesus said most. Say, what Jesus said is what matters most. That's why his words are in red. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another I love that word, another. It's the word allos. We're going to see it again in just a moment. Another, helper, that he may abide with you forever. Say the word abide. abide. He may abide with you forever. That doesn't mean he's going to abide with you. He may abide with you if you receive him. He may abide with you if you receive him. Remember what John said after what Jesus said in chapter 7. He said, those who believed in Christ would receive the Holy Spirit. You have to receive him. You have to receive him. That, that he may abide with you. Does that mean that, that you know, he doesn't have the capacity to stay with you? He does have the capacity to stay with you. But here is a very true fundamental principle. There are two camps out there. One camp has identified themselves under a title called monergism. And monergism is basically the thought that, you know, you can't get saved on your own, that everything is done through the work of Jesus Christ. It's a gift of grace. And, you know, you're saved because God selected that salvation for you. And in the monogeism thought that is strictly monogeistic, the thought is that God has already made a plan for those who are going to be saved and for those who are not going to be saved. And a lot of that kind of makes sense to us because we've embraced, you know, an intertwining of thought throughout the years. The monogeists, you know, carry another name, and their name is Calvinist. So they have this tulip ideal of salvation. Then there's another thought, and it's called synergism. But the problem is, is that monogeists think that synergists don't believe in monogeism. And actually, we do. We believe that our salvation is not of ourselves, that it can only be provided through Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the only one that can do the work of salvation. Just like a monogeist thinks. The difference is, is that we believe 
that God has given us a choice. And we choose. And so basically, in this fight between two thoughts, what we have is this battle that says that someone who believes in synergism believes in works and someone who believes in monergism believes in sloppy grace. And it's just not true because they've taken these terms that identify theological principles and they use them for identity rather than using them for principles. And so basically what happens is is someone who is under a title of monogeism, they'll walk around and, and they'll, you know, do everything the world does. They look like the world, they act like the world, they drink what the world drinks, they smoke what the world smokes, they, they do everything that the world does. And they said, but we're selected by God and it really doesn't matter because this is the way God made us. Synergism doesn't believe that. They believe that it's a choice. That grace is working to transform the will. And if there is no grace, then there is no salvation. And if there is no will, then there is nothing to be saved. And so the will must be converted. And so the will is always the one that is the mind, the will, and the emotions that is receiving the work of God in their life. Does that make sense to you? And so here in this portion of scripture, we find that Jesus is saying, he's saying, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments and I'm going to send you the truth, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. This is amazing because today in church, so many people feel alienated and they feel orphaned. They they, they even have a terminology for it, an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit is on me. And, and, And what is the antidote for that? The antidote is what Jesus said. He said, the helper is gonna come. And if you receive him, you won't feel orphaned anymore. You, you, can, you can be baptized initially in the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues, operate in giftings, but still have voids in your life. I love that portion of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 where it talks about if you think the, the ministry of Moses is great, wait until you see the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then it talks about how Moses was in the glory and he had to close his face, but the ministry of the Holy Spirit is greater than that and it's transforming us and we're moving from glory to glory even by the Spirit of the Lord. And there's that one portion of Scripture in there that's really great and we quote it all the time. And it's where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, let's just look at this. How many in here would say you're still dealing with things in your life? Okay. How many of you would say that R.T. Kendall nailed it on the head when he said the sovereignty of God is God everywhere, all the time, and all of his power? So how many would say that what that means is God is right here, right now? How many of you are still dealing with things in your life? But didn't we just quote the scripture that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's because, once again, we got to look at translation. And I'm not trying to retranslate the Bible. I'm just trying to tell you if you get a parallel Bible and you start looking at translations in the Bible, you're going to see that they don't all read together. And it doesn't mean that scripture is uh, is fallible. What it means is translation is. And that's why we should study to show ourselves approved the workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because some of us, you know, we, we subscribe to Holgram and another of us, we've subscribed to Nelson and another of us, we, we subscribe to Peterson or, you know, uh, uh, someone else who translated the Bible. Wycliffe Bibles, you know, Dakes Bibles. So we're King James, we're, we're subscribing to all different types of thought. And then we wonder why we have so much division because we're not on the same page. We might be on the same page, but we're not in the same words. 
Because that translation actually reads something more like this. That the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord, where the spirit is Lord, there is liberty. Yes, that's right. So the liberty doesn't come just because the Lord is here. The liberty comes is where you make the Lord, Lord of your life. When you make the spirit Lord of your life. So in the areas that you're still struggling, in the areas that you're still battling, in the areas that you're still trying to find footing, those are the areas that you need to surrender your will to God's will so that God's will can compose in you the fullness of his purpose and his plan. Because it's all been paid for. All we have to do is apply it. So Jesus says, the helper will come. I, I want you to remember that spirit of truth because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Man, time flies. Gosh, Lord have mercy. Slow the clock down. If I talk slow, will the clock get slower? No. Okay, so let's talk faster so we can beat time. All right, so jump down to verse 36. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So now, not only is Jesus saying in John chapter 7, I don't live by man's theology, I have one that comes from above. Now he's telling his disciples, now you're going to do the will, you're going to, you're going to do the will, but you have to understand, you can't do this by yourself. I'm sending you a helper. That's why he's called a helper, to help you. And he's going to come, this helper, this allos, this another, this another allos helper. And, and when he comes, he's going to teach you. He's going to teach you everything that I taught you. He's going to bring it to your remembrance. Now, let me just kind of give you a carnal thought. Is it all right? Everybody have a moment for a carnal thought? It can't be brought to your remembrance if it's not there the first time. Which is why Jesus said, as scripture has said. So read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. I was a resident missionary in the Philippines for um, two and a half years. One of the first assignments that I was given was to pastor church. We had 60 people in the church. We had phenomenal growth. In the first um, few weeks of the church, we grew from 60 to 40. And that was great. And the reason why that was great was not because I wanted, you know, the 20 that left to leave was because it um, kind of really diminished me and it broke my heart because I came to help the ministry and the ministry wasn't seeing help. It was seeing diminishing, which was probably help because then we grew from 40 to 500 in a year. And um, we had a, a, a nonstop church. We had a church that went um, seven days a week. We didn't have any days off. We went seven days a week. We had prayer every morning. We had all night prayer every weekend. We had outreaches on the weekend. It was a 24-7, 365 job to, to see that type of a growth. Now, I was in the Philippines, and being an American, you know, helped a lot, but it was mainly because of the Holy Spirit. And what started the growth was the prayer. And as we began to pray, that um, lights would begin to shine all around um, the church and people would come with buckets of water because they thought the church was on fire. And, and they realized that the church was not on fire and they began to be a part of the church and we began to do outreach Bible study. But every morning, um, you know, that, I mean, every Sunday morning, I would open up the service and I would tell the people in the congregation to turn to the person next to you and say, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Neglect your Bible, forget to pray, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. That's really clever, isn't it? It's not original. 
When I was in children's church, we used to sing, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, 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 and you'll grow, 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 and you'll grow, 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 read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And then, of course, you can read the negative part of that, too. Neglect your Bible, forget to pray, forget to pray, forget to pray. Okay, some of you guys are like, is he really going to sing all the way through that? Neglect your Bible, forget to pray, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. Uh, that's really funny. Neglect your Bible, forget to pray, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. Have to finish it. I had to finish it. Ah, <laughs> uh, hallelujah. So, so Jesus is saying, he's saying, I'm going to bring it to your remembrance. Now, notice already. He, he's talked about the Holy Spirit's going to come out of your belly shuffle of rivers, just like the scripture has spoken. Then he's saying, you're not going to be left alone. I'm going to send another, an allos, an allos, an allos. Very important Greek word we're going to get to in just a moment. And then he says again in 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit will come. So now we see... Here's Jesus reiterating this teaching on the Holy Spirit. And if you go down and you read just a little bit further, you're going to find that Jesus doesn't just stop there. He keeps on going. You can find in verse 26, he's uh, in chapter 15, he's talking more. And he says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So he's still talking about this Holy Spirit. He's never stopped talking about this Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's in the heart of God to be received. It's in the heart of the Father to be received. It's in the heart of the Son that's to be received. And it's the heart of the Holy Spirit to be received because these three are one. Just what we talked about last night in 1 John chapter 5, the three baptisms bear witness of the three that are in the heavens. You have the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the spirit, I mean, that is the blood baptism. You have the baptism of the disciples of other people in water. That's the water baptism. And then you have the baptism that Jesus performs where he baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. And that is the baptism of the Spirit. These three bear witness in the heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And on the earth, the three baptisms, the baptism of the blood, the baptism of the water, and the baptism of the Spirit, which are essential works because this is what John says, this is how they will know. This is how they will know. So receiving the Holy Spirit is an absolutely essential part of how the world will know. It's not about how great we grow our ministries. It's not about how we fine-tune our music. It's not about how articulate we talk. It's about whether or not we are hosting or we are a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So then he keeps on going in chapter 16. He doesn't just start. So now he started in chapter 7, and then he jumps over to chapter 14, and here he is again in chapter 15, and here he is again in chapter 16, and he's still talking about who? Holy Spirit. And, 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 and he says in, in chapter 16, if you jump down to, to, to verse 5, but, I, 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 but now I go away to him who sent me, and, and none of you ask me where am I going? Because I have said these things to you, and sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So, John 7 says that they were not yet baptized, they were not yet rivers of living water flowing out of them because this was something that would happen when Jesus would be glorified. Now Jesus is saying, I'm getting ready to be glorified. Get ready because the most important relationship of your life is getting ready to come. This is an Alice relationship. He said, it's to your advantage that I leave you. Jesus is saying, this relationship is better than the relationship that you have with me right now. 
the relationship you're about to have is going to set you in advantage. It is the advantage point of your life. Because when I'm with you, yes, I am with you. And I am the son of God. And yes, you have seen me work. But I'm going to leave and I'm going to be glorified. And I'm going to complete the work of the father. And when I complete the work of the father, there's someone, Allos, who is like me. Identical to me. We are of the same. We are of the same. There is the father. There is the son. And there is the Holy Spirit. We are the same. The difference is, is when you're walking with me, we're apart from each other. But when you're walking in the Holy Spirit, you're walking together as one flesh with God. And then he goes on and he says some beautiful things about the Spirit. He says, and when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and of sin they do not believe in me and of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more and judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So let's just cover this for a moment. What's the Holy Spirit going to do? The Holy Spirit's going to come to all of those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to bring conviction about their sin. And they will have an opportunity at that point to decide if they will allow grace to save their will, their soul. But those who believe, the Holy Spirit is going to come. And when he comes, he's going to testify. He's going to teach you. And it says, to those, righteousness. And what is the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to convict of righteousness. Why? What's he going to do? He's going to say every time that we are not walking in what has been provided for us, he is going to say, let me in. Yeah. Just like we see in the Laodicean church. In the Laodicean church, uh, they're crying out and they're saying, we don't need anything. We are rich. We are clothed. We, we, we don't need anything. And, and, and Jesus, he prophesies to them. And he says to them, you are naked and you are, you are miserable and you are wretched and you are blind. Buy of me gold that's, that's tried in the fire that you might see your true condition because you have been given a new life now. You have this new life now. See, when you were born into sin, sin was your master and you had nothing to do but sin. You had to sin because you did not have a choice. But Jesus liberated you and now the Holy Spirit brings you that life of Christ. And so now you serve righteousness just like you served sin. And when you're not serving righteousness and the Holy Spirit comes and he convicts. But then he says judgment. Judgment because the rulers of this age. What is that all about? What is this judgment because of the rulers of this age? Look at John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, Jesus is speaking and he's prophesying about being glorified. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, he said, he said these are things concerning the scripture. And then after that, there's a little end note that says Jesus had not yet been glorified. So in John chapter 12 and verse 27, it says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come for this hour. Turn to the person next to you and say, for this purpose, I have come for this hour. Let me just exhort you for a minute. Let me exhort you for a minute. There was a problem. How many of you are from Pensacola? There was a problem in Pensacola. A sin problem. A sickness problem. A relationship problem. So God had to put into place a remedy for that problem. He had to fix it because he loves the people. So you know what he did? He got you. You're his problem. That's why you're alive. You're alive because God wants to fix the problems of Pensacola. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, should I say, oh, take me out of this? Oh, no, 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 no. I was born for this. I was born. You, you should be waking up every morning saying, I receive you, Holy Spirit, together. We are going to tackle what I was born to do. I was born to change Pensacola. I was born to change the nations of the world. I was born to change my family. I was born for it. 
just like Jesus said. No, I was born for this. For this purpose I have come. Look at verse 31. Now the judgment of the world, now the ruler of the world will be cast down. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Now look at this. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to go to the sinner. He's going to convict the sinner. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to make sure that the Christian stays righteous. When the Holy Spirit comes, he is going to keep judgment over the rulers of the earth. What does that mean? That means when Jesus went to Calvary's cross and he said it was finished, he won the victory. He spoiled principalities and powers, had dominion over them, triumphed in it all. Total victory was won. And those who receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to put them in a place that every time the ruler of the world tries to step up, that they can stand in what Jesus has provided and through the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, say, at. Because Jesus already took care of the ruler of this world. But the church doesn't have the power to say, stop it. Because in order to say stop it, you have to receive the Holy Spirit. And the church thinks, oh, because I was in a meeting and I got touched by the Holy Spirit and I shook and I spoke in tongues, I received the Holy Spirit. And then every day they walk walk around and they're getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse because receiving the Holy Spirit isn't something that you do just one time. It's something that you do every day of your life. One day I was in prayer. Let me just share with you a couple of things that the Lord spoke to me in prayer. Okay, here it is. Consecration is putting oneself entirely at the disposal of God. In our sect of Christianity, we have a lot of thought on sanctification. But sanctification comes in response to our consecration. And our consecration is putting ourselves totally at the disposal of God. That's when you wake up in the morning and you say, fill me, Holy Spirit. I receive you. I welcome you into every aspect of your life. What happens is, is because we know that God is everywhere all the time in all of his power and that he's eternal, we somehow or another seem to think that he's always there all the time for us. And where he's always there, he's not always there all the time for us because we haven't invited him. I I, I find it kind of like in this story, this story about this man that came to the altar. I might have told this last time I was here. It's one of my favorite stories. You know what it is? No, you just shook your head. Yes. Oh, okay. All right, all right, okay. All right. So the guy comes to the altar. <laughs> the guy comes to the altar and he's praying at the altar and the message is really good and he's crying out at the altar and he's saying, fill me, fill me, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord. Did I tell the story last time I was here? No. No, okay. And, and he's crying out, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord. And one of the older ladies that was an elder in the church came up behind this fella and, 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 and stood behind this fella and, and he would cry out, fill me, She'd say, don't do it, Lord. Fill me, Lord. She said, don't do it, Lord. He got louder. Fill me, Lord. She said, don't do it, Lord. And he turned around and he said, why are you saying that? And she said, because you leak. God is wanting us to understand that that there is a a, a, a hunger that he has for us to hunger for him. And and so when when we're filled with the spirit of God, we can stand in, in what Jesus has provided. But we can't stand in what Jesus has provided without the spirit of God. Because the spirit of God brings us everything that belongs to Christ. Look at what Jesus says. He says, not only will he bring um, conviction for sin, not only will he bring righteousness, not only will he bring judgments, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth and he will not speak on his own authority, 
But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me. He will take of what is mine and he will declare it to you. All the things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of what is mine and he will declare it to you. That's why we need to receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the work of the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the thought that we have that we're opposed to in other religious sects is once saved, always saved. And, but then we have this thought in our brain that the Holy Spirit's always there and he's not always there. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, but that doesn't mean you didn't leave him or forsake him. Two scriptures and I'm done. Wow, 55 minutes. I got, I got to do this in five minutes. Just for the record, I always preach an hour because I'm a missionary. The, the, timer, the timer right here that says 56, 56 minutes and three seconds. Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 8. And he said, surely they are my people, children whom will not lie. So he became their savior. In all of their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. The angel of his presence saved him. The angel of his presence is the conveyor of the presence of God. Who is the angel of his presence? Let's read. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Who is the angel of the Lord? Who is the angel of his presence? The angel of his presence is the Holy Spirit in this passage of Scripture. Because the angel is the conveyor of the message or the conveyor of the image of God. And so here is a beautiful portion of Scripture of salvation, how God had pity on them, how God delivered them, how God brought them out, and, and the angel of his presence was always there helping them. But then, but, it can be a smelly word. <laughs> but they grieved and rebelled against the Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. Turn with me in the corresponding, the corresponding text of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Now, Get ready, get ready, because the first night was the three baptisms. The blood, the water, and the spirit. The baptism of Jesus, I mean the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. The baptism in the water, and the baptism of Jesus into the Holy Spirit. This is really important because look at verse 2. And all were baptized into Moses, a type of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus, the cloud, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the sea, the baptism of water. So here's the baptism. They all ate the spiritual food. They all drank the spiritual drink, for they drank of the rock and followed the rock, which was Christ. But with 
most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. For these things became examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. The people sat down, they ate and they drank, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in the day, on one day, 20,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them did also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happen to an example that they were written as of our admonition upon whom the ends of the age will come. Therefore, let us who thinks we stand Take heed lest we fall. So here's that same portion of scripture about how the angel of the presence of God was there, brought tremendous victory, but they rebelled against the Holy Spirit. They rebelled against the work of God. Now, if you look just one chapter back in chapter six, you see Paul is instructing them on the principle of one flesh. And what he says in, in, in chapter 6 is he says this, Now the body is not for sexual immorality, verse 13, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up in his power. Verse 14, tomorrow night we're going to get into this a little bit more, but I want to set this up because it's talking about rebelling against the Holy Spirit. Look at this. Here it says, Do, not, do you not know that your bodies are one member? Shall I take the member? of Christ and make them a heart um, make them members of a harlot certainly not or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her for the two shall become one flesh that's the principle of one flesh and in, in, a, in a consummated relationship the two become one flesh and this picture is being used about how it is that we involve ourselves with things around us that we are the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and every Everywhere we go, we're taking the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're here and you go to bars, you're taking the body of the Lord Jesus Christ into a bar. If you're here and you go into, you know, um, a, a strip clubs, you're taking the body of the Lord Jesus Christ into a strip club. If you're here and you go to rock concerts, you're taking the body of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, into a rock concert. And you might be saying, no, I'm going to evangelize. I'm telling you, you're taking a godly Christ into an ungodly area and that's why we have got to be careful about where we go who we associate with what we drink what we do how we act why because everywhere we go we are taking Christ with us everywhere and when we engage in it when we engage in foul language we're engaging Christ in foul language and we, when we engage in watching things that are impure, we are engaging Christ in the watching of things that are impure. Amen. And what does that tell us about how we reverence the Holy One? That's right. Look at what he says. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does on the outside of his body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Paul's talking about, you're the temple of God. He dwells in you. How many of you have ever been with somebody, maybe they were driving the car, and you were somebody, and they went somewhere that was kind of risky, and you were like, oh man, I don't want to be here. You're like, man, I don't want anybody to see me here. And you're like trying to hide. You're like, oh man, I don't, I don't want anybody seeing this, I, I'm, this is not where, I, but you went there because you weren't driving the car. You just, you were there, you had to go. 
And how many have been in that situation? Well, the Holy Spirit can identify with that because he's been in a lot of places he never wanted to be. Because you were driving and not him. That's why you need to receive him. Not just say, come on in, here in there. Theologically, I know you're in there, dude. Thank you for being there. But receive him by saying, I receive your lordship. I receive your instruction, your direction. Should I do this today? Should I go here today? You know, I, I, just kind of a carnal example. When I was in the airport yesterday, I saw this guy walking with his jacket and he had these really nice gray pants on. And I was like, you know what? All my pants are black. I like to have a pair of gray pants. But I like the, the skinny pants because I'm a skinny guy, except for the big thing, the bubble in the middle here. And um, so I, I said to, to Miss Maeve, I said to Miss Maeve, I said, um, you know, today I'd like to just take about maybe 20 minutes and check out your Rosses and your Bell Outlet and just see if they had something. And, and so, you know, the first place I went was J.C. Penney's because this is a sweater from J.C. Penney's. I didn't buy it here, but I buy my sweaters from J.C. Penney's. And so, you know, I went into J.C. Penney's and there wasn't anything there. And so I walked out and I realized that wasn't a mall where you can walk in the mall. You have to go outside and walk around. I was like, wow, that's kind of crazy. It's a little bit cold and raining today, but it's all right. So I went into Burlington Coat Factory and was in there. It takes me about two minutes each shop, so now I've spent about four minutes. It takes me a lot longer to preach than it does to shop. And then, and so I'm walking back to the car, and there's a lady there, and, and um, she's getting in her car, and I said, where's the Bell's outlet? There's a Bell's outlet. She said, yeah, it's down, and I think it's in the next mall down. So I get in the car, and I go down, and um, I go into Bell's outlet, and, and then I finally say, you know, Holy Spirit, it's not about whether I need these pants or not, but am I going to find these pants today? He said, no. I said, thank you for saving me a lot of time. And I got in the car and I drove back home. And as soon as I pulled into the parking lot, Brother Russ had just gotten in from his appointment this morning. And so it was just the perfect timing. Now, you might say, you know, what does that have to, that's about welcoming the Holy Spirit. See, I was on that venture for a pair of skinny leg um, gray pants on my own. It was just something I was going to do. I didn't think God was concerned about it. But if I would have asked the Holy Spirit, I could have saved myself a trip to Burlington, a trip to, 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 to J.C. Penney's, and a trip to Bell's Outlet. I mean, I could have saved myself, you know, about 35 minutes worth of driving and shopping time. I mean, that was a big waste of time. I could have spent that time in prayer or that, that time, you know, watching Fox News if the Holy Spirit wanted me to watch Fox News. Maybe he wanted me to watch CNN. No, he doesn't want to watch CNN. That's about, you know, going in with the harlot. Now, ah, what, what is that all about? Oh, so. <laughs> but we're going to stop there tonight because I think the picture has been drawn pretty clear that Jesus had a lot to say about receiving the Holy Spirit, about it being an advantageful relationship, the most important relationship. You know, today, people get married and just recently, even today, I heard a story about how this wonderful man did everything for his wife, made her coffee, cooked her breakfast, did everything for her. And then he passed away and she's like, I didn't realize how much he did for me. I was at home just the other day. We were having our um, Friday night, all night prayer meeting and it was three o'clock in the morning. We had one more hour to pray. And Chantel, um, she is a, she's the daughter of a tribal king in Cameroon, and she's a princess, but she's on staff at camp. And she got married about a year ago, and um, she was pregnant, and, you know, she was about to have the baby. And she, her husband came in and, and said to me, Glenn, um, will you take us to the, to the hospital? So I went and I got my truck and, and brought it down, and, and she got in the truck, and and, um, you know, we're driving to the hospital, and, you know, she said, my water broke. And I was like, okay, and just driving down the road, you know, <laughs> got her to the hospital. She got in the hospital, like, three hours later, she had her baby. It was just that quick, you know. And, and um, so the next day, my wife and I were going down to see my daughter, and I was putting the, the luggage in the car, and I put my hand on the seat, and it was all wet. And I said, what is that? And, um, 
And Debbie said, Debbie said, Chantel told you her water broke. And I said, I didn't know she meant in the car. <laughs> Now, why did I tell you that story? That was a funny story. <laughs> if your water breaks, don't do it in the back seat of my truck. <laughs> Lord, I know there's a reason I was going there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so, so, um, so um, you know, the, they, they have the baby, the baby's in the hospital for a day, and then they, they'll release her the next day. And that's the day we get back from, you know, my daughter's program down in, in South Carolina. And so um, I go and pick, her, pick him up. And, and so we're in the car and we're driving home. And he just, he says, you know, in, in Jamaica, because he's Jamaican, he says, in Jamaica we have a custom, and that is we don't want to wait until you die before we tell you how much we appreciate you. And this is all about receiving the Holy Spirit. Marriage today is a reflection of our spiritual walk because we received the Holy Spirit when we were first saved, but then, you know, we didn't welcome him every day. We didn't appreciate him every day. We didn't invite him. We didn't receive him every day. And I'm not talking about our doctrine of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about every day just having a heart that wants to receive the Holy Spirit. Every service having a focus that just wants to receive the Holy Spirit. I preach on the glory a lot too, but when I preach on the glory, my focus is the glory is the presence of the Lord. If you're in the glory, you're in the presence. If you're in the presence, then the person is there. You're not there for the glory. You're not there for the presence. You're there for the person. Yes. So don't let the glory be the distraction. Go through the glory to the person because the glory is there to reveal the presence of the person that's there for you. And that's the same with the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you tonight for your glory. Lord, for your presence. We receive you tonight. 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 Tonight is Saturday night. We have church tomorrow. So we're not going to do a lingering at the altar. But tomorrow night is Sunday night. Tomorrow night is Sunday night. And we are going to have another lingering at the altar like we did the first night. But I don't want anybody to have an excuse for not being in church tomorrow morning. But what I do want to do right now is I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit gives you gifts. And those gifts are to edify, to comfort. They're there for exhortation. And, and those gifts are not there for you to choose when to use them. They're there to minister to the people that are there. And one thing that if I was doing a training session here is I would say, just like I say all over the world, that if God has given you the gift, you use the gift until everybody is done. You use the gift until everybody is done. Reverend Wallace Heflin used to say, he used to say that God never stops speaking to his people. We just stop listening. Amen. Some people will say, well, you know, um, I, I don't feel in my spirit to, to, to prophesy. Well, sometimes there's an order that God has for the service and you're going to do something else. But when it comes for the gifting, you know, it's not just about the selection, you know, well, I'm going to do, you know, a couple people in the beginning of the service and a couple people at the end of the service, and, you know, then people will see the gift in operation. No, the gift is there for everybody. And if you want the gift to be sharpened in your life and you want the gift to be enriched in your life, then learn how to do what Jesus did. It said that Jesus saw them as sheep that had no shepherd, and he had compassion on them, and he ministered over them all. And so last night we were here and we ministered over everybody. But tonight, there's people that were not here last night. And if you were not here last night to receive ministry, that's who I want to minister over right now. So if you did not receive prophetic ministry last night, I would like you to come. And I would like you to come. If you did not receive prophetic ministry. If you received prophetic ministry, hallelujah. Thank you, guys. If you receive prophetic ministry, now go walk in that. 
tomorrow you don't want to miss in the morning. Dr. Russ Moyer is going to explode. He's fantastic. Amen. Then tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, everybody say tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. 6 o'clock. We get to say goodbye to Glenn. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you did not receive ministry last night, just come on up. Hallelujah. That's what I said. I said there's going to be a totally different crowd here tonight than there was last night. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Just raise your hands. Let's just pray in the Holy Spirit right now. Get ready, my daughter, for the waters are stirring. The waters are stirring. And you're going to find yourself going in deeply as my hand of anointing is upon thee. Uh, there is much that I am going to release in and through thee. So watch and see. Uh, the waters are stirring. Uh, and not only are the waters stirring that you might launch into them, uh, but the waters are stirring because they are going to flow out of you in great measure. Uh, for know that this is a time of cleansing. This is a time uh, of purifying. This is a time uh, of setting things in order, says the Lord. Uh, so I am working and I am moving and I am stirring the waters. I am stirring the waters. Uh, and these are the days of increased faith for I am working and moving and you shall find uh, even change even now as I am working and moving I'm releasing uh, upon you uh, a, a, a new faith I'm releasing upon you uh, a new uh, a new level of belief in me and you shall be amazed at how it is that I shall work in and through thee uh, in great measure says the Lord God hallelujah hallelujah what's wrong with your legs I broke my hip you broke your hip all right hallelujah and how long how long ago was that about a month, about a month. so it's about healed now are you in any pain? Not quite. No, pain's very, very just, little. Just having, okay. Father, we just thank you right now for healing in this hip. Yes, right now, every part of this hip, whether it be ligament, whether it be bone, be healed in Jesus' name. Healing is the children's bread. You sent your word to heal them. That by the stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were healed. And we receive that right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, total mobility. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Is there any way that you could tell if there's a change? Um, not really. Um, not really? Okay. All right. Well, we're believing God for, yes. for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Know that I'm causing the roots to go deep and I'm causing the branches to go wide because the roots were going to keep you from the blowings of the storms for there have been many storms round about you, but know that the storms are not there to destroy you. I placed you in the storm that you might speak to the storm, saith the Lord, and your roots are deep that they might hold on to me and the branches are wide that they might be a place for reaching for those that are in the storm, saith the Lord. So watch and see uh, as that which is flowing in and through thee uh, shall be a ministration to those round about thee uh, as they are going through the circumstances uh, and you bring to them wise counsel as you bring to them comfort uh, as you bring to them a release of my presence says the Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, get ready, my daughter, for this is a time that I'm causing you to spring even higher. Like a trampoline, I'm causing you to spring even higher, saith the Lord. And thou shalt find thyself soaring above, soaring above for where you have been. It has been like the, the ground feeder level, but I am going to cause you to soar like an eagle that you might see from high up, that you you might see uh, how small things really are, saith the Lord, uh, and I'm putting inside of you right perspective, for there has been perspective uh, that has kind of altered uh, the way that you believe, the way that you acted, the way that, that you engaged yourself and things round about you, uh, but this is a time of aligning you uh, with my thoughts, and the mind that's going to be in you is going to be that mind that was in Christ Jesus, uh, says the Lord God. Uh, oh, get ready, my daughter, uh, for these are the time uh, that I'm pouring out the healing bomb, uh, for there have been 
been many uh, that have said peace, peace, but there was no peace for they ministered superficially. Uh, but I am pouring out a healing balm for I am a physician uh, and I am a healer uh, and you shall find yourself flowing uh, in a, a, a new level of mobility. You shall find yourself uh, flowing in the ease as I pour out upon you the balm of my glory uh, for there, there, there is a glory and the glory brings forth uh, the ease, uh, saith the Lord God. Uh, oh, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet for know that I have given you uh, songs of deliverance and as thou shalt lift up uh, that song that I place inside of you, you shall be amazed uh, at how there shall be a crushing and a breaking uh, for I see drugs being broken. Uh, I see those who are bound uh, by, by, by substances being broken. Uh, I see those round about you that you've had a heart for, uh, Lord, uh, that you've had a, a desire to, to see changed. Uh, and God says, as you lift up that song, it shall be a song of deliverance and it shall bring breakthrough, saith the Lord. Uh, know that I put a breaker's anointing upon your life uh, and these are the days of great release, uh, saith the Lord God. Uh, oh, get ready, my daughter, for I'm going to increase your capacity to receive knowledge of me uh, and intimacy with me. You shall be amazed uh, at how it is you shall know me for I'm awakening your heart to love uh, and adore me. Uh, adore me. Uh, I'm awakening your heart that you might pour out before me. Uh, I'm awakening your heart uh, that, that you might receive my love uh, and that you might love that you might love me uh, in return for I am making you freely flowing uh, in an awakened heart uh, saith the Lord uh, know my daughter that what I'm doing in you is for eternity it's not just for day uh, for today or even tomorrow for these shall pass away uh, but what I'm making of you and I'm doing of you is for eternity so watch and see uh, for those things that are happening even in the natural uh, they are for eternal reward for my hand of anointing uh, is connecting you not only with the natural realm with the heavenly realm uh, and you shall be uh, even as that one uh, that Paul said, I knew a man who entered into the three heavens. Uh, I shall give you a revelation. I shall give you a revelation and understanding and you shall be amazed uh, at what I shall do in and through thee uh, for its eternity uh, that's going to be released. Uh, oh no, uh, the one thing you asked of the Lord uh, and he gave you. Uh, oh, whether big, whether small, he answered your call because you're his child and he's your God and he loves you uh, and there is a release of my anointing in greater measure upon thee. So ask largely, ask largely, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be, be open. It's a progression of elevation, asking, seeking, finding each time a greater intensity, each time a greater measure of application, but each time a greater release of my anointing. So ask for I say unto thee the precious things of heaven will fall on you and the things of this world will charm you no more because I am going to bring you uh, into a place uh, that when you ask concerning the things of the Spirit, I shall release them uh, unto you, says the Lord God. Uh, oh, get ready, my daughter, uh, for I'm going to send you uh, into places that you did not know, for this is a time of release of my glory. Uh, this is a time of stepping uh, into new places, uh, not to stay within the confines of familiarity, but I'm bringing you into a place uh, of the unknown, saith the Lord, uh, for the unknown shall become very well known known and when the unknown becomes well known I shall carry you again into another place of the unknown so watch and see uh, for this shall not only be in the natural but it shall be in the spirit as well uh, for this is a time uh, of transportation uh, for I am transporting you remember Philip and how it was uh, that in one city he had a revival uh, but then in a face to face encounter with another uh, there was the baptism that impacted a nation uh, oh yes uh, the revival of the city sounds great uh, but the impact of the nation uh, because of that one that he met uh, and, and baptized uh, the Ethiopian eunuch uh, impacted a nation so there is no telling uh, whether it's with the crowd or whether it's with the one because the one that you meet that's apart from the crowd could be the one that changes the nation uh, so watch and see as I'm bringing you into new places uh, for it is a time uh, of transportation says the Lord God uh, oh get ready my daughter uh, for this is a time uh, in which I'm causing your wings uh, to begin to, to, to grow 
grow even greater feathers, save the Lord, for even uh, as an eagle uh, um, uh, molts uh, and takes in its, its feathers fall uh, and its beak is crushed and its, uh, its claws are removed, uh, but he renews himself that this is a time of renewal, save the Lord, uh, for I am making a renewal inside of you. I am bringing a, a renewal in you, save the Lord. Uh, it's a time in which the feathers shall lift you uh, into a higher place. It's a time in which your wingspan uh, shall be greater than before. It's a time in which the currents can uh, grab hold to thee because of the enlargement, save the Lord. Uh, so allow the renewal to be uh, complete inside of thee, uh, save the Lord God. Uh, oh, get ready, my daughter. For I am causing things to be turned uh, even now, saith the Lord, for there are situations uh, that are in place. There are relationships uh, that are in turbulence. There are things uh, that, are, that are in confusion, but I am not a God of confusion, but I am a God that brings order in the midst of chaos, uh, and I'm placing upon you uh, the anointing for peace. Uh, and as you stand in the shalom, you shall be amazed at how it is uh, that you shall have authority uh, over the power of chaos and destruction, uh, and you shall bring things into order. Uh, oh, yes, let not your peace be taken from you, but hold on to your peace, saith the Lord, uh, for the peace that you have is not the peace that the world gives, uh, but it's a heavenly peace, saith the Lord, uh, for the world can only keep peace, but I am making you uh, a peacemaker, saith the Lord, uh, for the peacemakers are the sons of God, uh, and you are my child. So watch and see, uh, as what is done is not just to keep, but what is done is to make, uh, saith the Lord God. Uh, oh, get ready, my son and my daughter, for these are the days of enlargement. These are the days uh, of growing. These are the days uh, in which I'm causing your territories uh, to be enlarged. You shall be amazed uh, at how I shall bring a enlargement. They shall be financial enlargement. Uh, for I'm going to cause those things that you put your mind to, those things that you put your hand to, uh, they shall prosper. You shall be amazed uh, at the, the contracts that shall come your way. I just see contracts. I don't know which one of you guys work with contracts, uh, but I see contracts uh, and I see uh, that one contract contract is going to be multiplied. It was a time of addition in your life, but God says now you moved into a time of multiplication, says the Lord, for he's going to cause you even at a young age because of your responsibility at a young age because of your faithfulness to understand and to know the responsibility of having great resource placed within your hands. God says get ready because there's going to be a wave of financial resource that's going to come into your hands and you're going to be those people uh, who are who are used as distributors uh, distributors of the wealth of the kingdom of heaven uh, and you're going to distribute it into the nations and I see you working with children and I see you uh, working uh, now I know that you're up there and you're playing the keyboard and singing so it doesn't take a rocket scientist to prophesy I see you working in music but but I see you, you you're working uh, and, and as you're working uh, and you're building I see you building things I see you uh, uh, occupying auditoriums and I see you working in the midst of, 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 of great crowds and and I see you releasing uh, the, the, the love of the Lord. The, I, I, the children part of that uh, is, is, is that Jesus said, uh, suffer not the little children to come unto me. The children part of that is Jesus said, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be like a child. Uh, uh, the children part of that is Jesus saying uh, that, that praise is perfected in the children. Uh, and God says that there's always going to be a, a, a child around you. There's always going to be children around you because uh, God is showing you uh, the, the fullness of the kingdom and the delight of the heart and the sensitivity of the heart of the people. Uh, and God says, get ready. I just keep on seeing. Uh, I see uh, like, uh, like the baskets uh, and, and, and they're just overflowing and God just says, get ready because resources is getting ready to come. Uh, you've known God in miracles of provision, but God says uh, that you are going to be one who stands uh, in the anointing just to be able to, to, to write great checks, to, to finance building contracts, to, to finance the work of God, to, to send young people people uh, in, in, into to college, to send young people into Bible school, to, yes. to finance it, to be able to, to write the checks, to, to be able to, to conduct surgeries on people. Uh, I just see you, you know, it's kind of like that Make-A-Wish Foundation. You're going to be like the people who finance it and finance that. And it's not like a Make-A-Wish Foundation. It's like the Answer of Prayer Foundation where, where people are praying and they're crying out and, and, and they're going through difficulty, but you're able to, to cause them not only to, to have things that will benefit 
benefit them uh, in regard to like surgery or like that, but to also to bring delight to their heart. But it's going to be so connected to the, mer- the work of the ministry and connected to the salvation of their hearts and, and change of life and filling of the spirit. God says, uh, you've been hungry for the spirit of God. Uh, and God says, you're going to see in this year of 2019, uh, the new beginnings that he promised in 2018 that you never saw manifest. Uh, they're going to come into completion uh, because this hand of anointing uh, is upon you uh, and it's God's time uh, to favor you, uh, says the Lord. Hallelujah. There's a, a craftsmanship that's in your hand and God's saying uh, that in this time and in this season, even as he raised up those uh, who, who designed uh, and they made the artifacts that were placed in position for the temple of, 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 of Solomon and, and for the, the tabernacle of Moses, God says that same artisanship is inside of you, uh, but it's a different type of artisanship. For for those temples were ecumenical temples, uh, but that which is going to be designed of you is going to be uh, like the Amos 9-11 tabernacle of, of David, the rebuilding of a tabernacle of, of, of intimacy and relationship and communion and fellowship with the Lord. Uh, and God says that he's going to teach you uh, how to abide under the shadow uh, of his wing, uh, that those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty uh, and say, the Lord is the refuge and fortress in God in whom he can trust. And there's been a lot of trust issues through the years, but God is bringing you uh, into that place uh, where you're resting under the shadow of the wing uh, and you're going to find that noisome pestilence. You're going to find uh, that, that the fowler cannot touch you, uh, that there might be a, a thousand that fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. Uh, but God says you're going to stand and God's going to be with you. Uh, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when a nation was bowing, they were standing because they had a God uh, worth standing for and they weren't going to bow to anyone. Uh, And God says that now uh, he's bringing you into that place where you stand with him and you're going to be amazed uh, at the intimacy uh, that's going to arise. If the Lord know that I've raised you to be a leader and not a follower and in the days to come, you shall be amazed at the impact uh, that you shall have for the words that you shall speak shall not be that of the status quo for you shall speak from a higher authority. Uh, Even as Jesus said tonight in tonight's teaching uh, in John chapter seven, uh, uh, what I speak comes from above. Know that you shall speak words uh, that shall begin uh, to change uh, the environment. They shall change the atmosphere. They shall change the circumstances uh, because they will not be the ordinary words of man. Uh, They will not be what everybody else is doing. Uh, But no, uh, there will be those who will try to pull you down. uh, But know that I'm giving you the strength to raise them up and you shall be amazed that in the raising uh, that there is going to be a release uh, of favor upon your life for I've called you to be a leader, saith the Lord God. Uh, Oh, you have not yet begun to see the deep places that I desire to carry these, saith the Lord. Uh, You have not yet begun to see uh, the places in my spirit and the places in the natural uh, for I have gifted thee and I have anointed thee uh, and I have given seen your hearts of compassion and pursuit for me saith the Lord uh, and as you have pursued me uh, I am revealing myself in even greater measure Uh, watch even in these next six months uh, as I reveal myself time and time again uh, and my glory is revealed in and through thee uh, this is a time uh, in which I am causing uh, those things round about thee uh, that have been bonded those things that have been round about thee uh, that have kind of held you back. I am cutting every chain. Uh, I am breaking every barrier, but I am not only breaking every barrier and cutting every chain. Uh, I am telling you that I have made you the knife. I have made you uh, the sword. Oh yes, uh, you shall have the anointing uh, of Essachar uh, and you shall be able with the right hand and the left hand be able to fight ambidextrously. Uh, oh yes, you shall be like those uh, who take the plow shears uh, and make them in the swords uh, and take the swords uh, and make them in the plowshares. Uh, oh yes, you shall not only fight uh, and defeat the enemies uh, that try to come against what it is God has given you. Uh, you shall take that same weapon of war uh, and make it into a plowshare uh, to cause the increase of growth and development in that which I have given uh, and you shall be amazed uh, for what I am doing. Uh, is going to be exponentially large. It's not just going to be a small portion, but I have called thee to great things. I have called thee to great platforms. I have called thee to great impact. So watch and see as you are humbled before me. I am going to raise you up, saith the Lord, and you shall be amazed for I have given you the sound of heaven for even in your voice as you sing. It is like a frequency of heaven that begins to break through the barriers 
years, it is a frequency of heaven uh, that begins to break through the obstacles. Uh, it begins to bring change into the atmosphere. Uh, oh, some would say it's a song, uh, but I would say, no, it's not the song for the song that you have sung uh, was a song that another wrote, uh, but no, it is the frequency that I have placed inside of you. It's the anointing that I have placed inside of you. Uh, and in the days to come, uh, you shall be amazed for you shall not only sing their songs to bring deliverance, uh, but you shall sing your songs. Uh, and as you sing your songs, they shall be songs uh, that shall begin to cause an explosion in the atmosphere uh, of my presence, saith the Lord. Uh, oh, get ready, my son, uh, for this is a day of promotion and elevation, saith the Lord. Uh, I am causing your resources uh, even to be touched and changed even now, uh, for you shall see bonuses and increased in wage, saith the Lord. Uh, oh yes, and you shall also see promotion in position for my hand of anointing uh, is upon thee. Uh, and because you have been faithful in the little thing, uh, I make you ruler over much, saith the Lord. He got here first. Actually, I've been here all <laughs> oh. okay. You drink hers if you know it's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll drink hers if I know it's good for you. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> God bless you guys. Hallelujah.